folks. So I want to start where uh, Paul's uh, excellent uh, talk at lunch uh, ended, which is the simple equation that all of us know when we think about uh, national strategy, military power, and artificial intelligence, which is that if you take a robot and you give it a brain and you give it a gun, what you get is the destruction of humanity. Whether it's the Matrix, whether it's Battlestar Galactica, whether it's the Avengers Age of Ultron, whether it's the Terminator, this always happens. I mean, if you gave Wally a gun, like, who knows what that crazy guy would have gotten up to? And, and I mean, look, look, honestly, it says more about us, I think, and what we think artificial intelligence would do and how we value ourselves, perhaps, than anything else. But what I want to do is sort of broaden out a little bit to talk about what the implications of, of artificial intelligence might be for the future of power, and specifically military power. And to understand that, I think what we need to understand is what kind of innovation we're talking about. You have different kinds of innovation in history that have different kinds of consequences and that different kinds of countries have access to. Because when we're talking about the impact of AI on the future of power, we're not just talking about what can AI do. We're talking about who can access it, who can control it, who the leaders are going to be. And you have different kinds of innovations. So here we just have a continuum. We're you know, moving from something that spreads really slowly to something that spreads really quickly. So we can start with something that spreads really slowly. Take nuclear weapons. North Korea proved that you can put your nickels in a jar every year for 40 years and eventually get a nuclear weapon. But nuclear weapons are really capital intensive. They're very difficult to acquire. There's a whole international system designed to prevent you from doing so. They spread really slowly. Now, here's something in the middle, something like uh, fourth generation fighter aircraft, which are reasonably expensive and difficult to, uh, difficult to produce yourself. But the technology is reasonably old, and it, they're pretty, they're, you can purchase them from lots of different uh, potential actors. So those have, say, why don't we say those have diffused at a medium rate? This is then something that you can get, you know, pretty much any city in the world, and that's, in, and that's an AK-47, something that's extremely cheap to produce and widely available. So what we want to understand is what is artificial intelligence then? What is AI going to look like? And I want to start that by comparing it to uh, one of the most important military innovations and military technological innovations of the last generation, that being stealth. Stealth as a technology has spread extremely slowly, if at all. It spread really slowly because the unit cost is extremely high, it's really complex, and the underlying components are military oriented. There's no commercial purpose to uh, stealth. Artificial intelligence is not stealth. Artificial intelligence is more like the combustion engine of the, the 21st century. And it's been inspiring, actually, being here today as someone who mostly, um, well, mostly sits in my office, but who, who, you know, who studies uh, these issues and spent time in the national security community in, in hearing all of the different applications uh, of AI, from the finance sector to healthcare to, uh, to energy. And I think it really drives home the fact that we're not talking about a weapon here when we think about this from a national security context. We're talking about something that's going to be part of everything, which means from a power perspective, if you want to understand who's going to win and who's going to lose, you need to understand not just the technology itself, but what applications of the technology uh, might look like uh, going forward. So here are several, I want to now take you through essentially several examples of potential uses of artificial intelligence for, uh, for national security purposes. Uh, this one uh, you can think about as, as swarms. You know, here we have a, a shot of a, of, you know, a swarm of little drones sort of attacking, uh, attacking uh, uh, some sort of, uh, sort of naval ship. And this is something that only happens with AI, only happens with the ability to coordinate uh, between those, uh, b between those that between the swarm, because otherwise, you know, a person wouldn't be able to control all of those interactions. 
But this isn't just something that will be relevant for uh, the Navy. It's something that's relevant for, the, for armies at the tactical level. It's something that will be relevant for surveillance, especially if you look at some of the trends even in, in drones today with the way that, say, police forces and others are, are acquiring some of these uh, capabilities for surveillance purposes. And so what AI is going to enable is the mass coordination of, uh, of, different, of different kinds of weapons and of different kinds of systems. That's very different than building an aircraft carrier. It's a different kind of capability. It's a capability built in software in some ways rather than hardware. And historically, innovations based in software, innovations where everybody has similar equipment, and it's what you do with it that really matters, tend to be the most disruptive. You know, think about, think about Blitzkrieg. When the, when the Nazis conquer France in six weeks, accomplishing something that they had tried to do for, for generations. We know that you know, before the battle, and if you saw the, the great movie you know, Dunkirk, but you know, before the Battle of France starts, the, the French and the British have about the same number of tanks as the Germans, the same number of trucks, the same number, uh, same number of troops. They've all got bullets. But what the Nazis understand is how to use those technologies better. And that, I think, is what's going to be critical to power in this arena. And it's especially true when we start thinking about fighting at machine speed, which is a, a phrase that former Deputy Secretary of Defense uh, Bob Work, well, I guess I was going to say was, but is, uh, fond of using, in that it captures the way that humans may be at a disadvantage on the future battlefield. We like to think that we add something to the equation. And we, and we do add something to the equation. We add judgment uh, to the equation. And, and that's also the, the ethical and moral piece when it gets to autonomous weapons that Paul mentioned uh, at lunch. But in order to compete, and this actually goes back to Amir's presentation in the morning, in order to compete, you have to think about what your adversaries are going to do. And we exist in a world where most of the major competitors to the United States are actors that believe in their people less than the United States does. You know, think about when the Mubarak regime fell in Tahrir Square. They, Mubarak falls during the Arab Spring because his troops won't fire on their own soldiers. Imagine if you didn't need those troops anymore because you have an AI system powering uh, powering military systems on the ground, in the air, wherever they are. There's a risk here, essentially, that autocratic regimes can use artificial intelligence to reduce their reliance on people that they don't trust in the first place. And so countries like China, uh, Russia, others are pushing really hard in this technology. And you don't want to enter a world, of course, from a military competition perspective, where others can fight faster than you. This is the competitive pressure that can increase the risk of accidents if people aren't careful in developing technology, but it's critical to keep in mind. The third thing I want to talk about is first mover advantages. The United States has had a historic first mover advantage when it came to the pro most prominent military innovation of the last generation, that being the, the precision strike complex. Like when you watch CNN or Fox News or whatever and you see and the United States goes to war and you see an image of a bomb like not just hitting a building but going through the you know, upper left-hand window on the second floor of a four-story building, you know, that's precision strike. And in fact, that is spread reasonably slowly throughout the world. It's given the United States a generation-long advantage in that capability. And it's given the United States a, a generation-long advantage in part because a lot of the aspects of it, like stealth, which I mentioned before, were things that the United States could keep secret. When military innovations involve technology where the underlying basis is commercial, when it's more software, it diffuses quickly. Commercial, all the companies that many of you work for will spread this technology around the world regardless of what a country like the United States does, which means first mover advantages decline because mimicry becomes easier and rapid adoption occurs. What that means is that in a world of AI, 
to stay ahead, you have to move faster, which means things like faster uh, production cycles, uh, shorter buys potentially for uh, military technology, and being willing to then offload more behind the warfighter, thinking about here the logistics, other aspects of, the, of how militaries uh, operate, to try to stay ahead. Because in any given widget, any given piece of technology, the first mover advantages in an era of AI may be actually very uh, small. Third thing I want to talk about, I want to queue up by with a picture of this, which is the HMS Dreadnought. This was the first all big gun battleship. The British produced it in 1906. We, we now know it as part of the Anglo-German uh, arms race. But this, you know, when this boat you know, hits the water, it's by far the most powerful sort of ship in the world. But at the end of the day, it's actually not about the boat. Because what the dreadnought did was force a revolution in engineering. It used to be, you know, before the dreadnought, you know, imagine like naval, like if you've ever seen Pirates of the Caribbean, where, you know, the ships just like come up to each other and like fire away. The amount of engineering talent you needed to run the guns on a like Pirates of the Caribbean old ship of sail, not that sophisticated. As the distance in naval warfare increases, and you have ships trying to hit, other, ships are moving, trying to hit other ships that are moving over a period of sort of miles rather than feet. Now you need calculus. And now you need what's, what was called continuous aim fire. So instead of some like random Yahoo like me potentially running the guns on a, a ship, you need an engineer. You have to change training. You have to change recruiting. You have to change doctrine to get the right people in and have them know what to do in order to continue to produce military power. I think AI will be very similar. It's going to require militaries around the world to not just buy new technology. Militaries love buying new technology. That's just, you know, those are more widgets and things to buy. It's going to require changing who they recruit, what they train them to do, and how military operations uh, function. There's risk here as well for, say, a country like the United States. This is a picture of the X-47B. This was going to be the most sophisticated futuristic drone with an algorithm it could take off from and land on an aircraft carrier. This was, this was some seriously cutting edge technology. It's now in mothballs, and it was replaced with a program to that an air-to-air -air refueling program so that inhabited aircraft wouldn't be disrupted off of an aircraft carrier deck. There's a difference here, essentially, between inventing technology, which the United States excels at, and adopting technology that's disruptive when you're already the best in the world. So when you're already the best, the incentives to innovate can decline. In the case of the X-47B turning into an air-to-air -air refueling uh, drone, exemplifies that. This gets to then the question of who do you trust? It's the last thing that I want to talk about, which is it's not just then about having these capabilities. It's not just about the application of artificial intelligence. It'll become about what you trust that artificial intelligence to do. And I think today's conversations illustrate the distributed ways that AIs will influence national power. This is something that goes beyond then sort of militaries and where, where humans will have to make the decisions, not just about, uh, say, something like autonomous weapons, but about self-driving cars and what we want the rules to be, about autonomous surgeries and who gets to make the decisions uh, for, when, uh, for when, those will, when those will occur. This question of trust, I think, will be, uh, will be critical. What this adds up to, I think, is a situation that for the United States could actually end up being pretty uh, risky. There's an incentive when you're the best to rest on your laurels, but these two pictures at the top illustrate the danger of that. On the left, we have the, the British, uh, British battle cruiser, the Prince of Wales, being sunk by Japanese naval aviation at the outset of World War II. It's the end of the era of the battleship, definitively. The British don't adapt, and their navy declines. On the right, we have the longbow, which the British debut against the French and end the era of the night. The French thought it was cheating, but whatever. These are some of the capabilities that make the United States the best in the world today. 
beyond, of course, its people, which are you know, the real thing that makes the American military the best. The risk for the United States is that this aircraft carrier and that F-22 becomes something that holds the United States back because the United States becomes so addicted to them that it can't innovate to stay ahead in the future. Thank you. All right, so next, uh, and Michael's actually gonna be joining us again here in a few minutes, uh, but first, who we're gonna call to the stage is Will Weissert. He's, the, uh, he's been with the Associated Press for 17 years. He's been the chief of the Austin Bureau for the last three, since 2014. Uh, Will has covered everything from uh, local to national to international uh, politics. He uh, did a lot of work on the 2016 presidential elections. He spent a lot of time abroad. He uh, has covered everything in Latin America from prison riots, papal visits, to uh, military coups. Um, in 2016, Will was embedded with the U.S. Marines and the U.S. Army uh, in different parts of Iraq and uh, covered um, a lot of different geopolitical events in that region. So please help me in welcoming uh, Will Weissert. Good afternoon, everybody. I am Will Weissert. I'm the Bureau Chief of the Associated Press Bureau in Austin. Um, at AP, we don't cover a lot of AI specifically. Uh, one thing that AP does do is we have automated stories that, um, as of a couple of years ago, are generated by computer for things that we don't think are very well read, like minor league baseball and women's uh, WNBA basketball and uh, some of the financial market reports. But it's a real bummer for people like me because when you started at AP, the big thing was you had to be really fast, and um, it's really hard to be faster than an automated story. Um, anyway, <laughs> so I'm gonna introduce our, our panel. We're having a panel on AI and policy. It should be a really interesting discussion. We have a great panel. Um, our, our, our first uh, panelist is Christopher Burnham. Mr. Burnham uh, is chairman of uh, the Cambridge Global Advisors, he, uh, which he co-founded in 2013. He is a globally recognized expert on, on uh, management of complex multi-billion dollar uh, companies and global organizations. Um, he most recently was a member of Donald Trump's presidential transition team at the State Department. Um, he, he, is, um, he has uh, had a, a long uh, career also in, uh, in governments, in, in good governments, he's an expert in good governments. He uh, served as uh, Under Secretary General for the United Nations for Management, and he was known as the Chief Operating Officer at the UN. He was appointed by Kofi Annan in, in June of, of 2005, and he was the highest ranking American for the United uh, Nations Secretariat when that happened. Um, uh, earlier in his career, he was an, an energy investment banker. He was a tw he's also a 24-year veteran of the Marine Corps, uh, and he volunteered for active duty during the first Gulf War, and he served as an infantry platoon commander and he was part of the uh, Allied Forces to liberate uh, Kuwait City. And uh, he holds degrees from Washington Lee University and from Harvard. Um, we also have uh, um, our second, second panelist is, is Paul Shari. Uh, he is a senior fellow and director of the Technology and National Security Program at the Center for a New American Security. And he has a forthcoming book, which will be due out in April 2018, which is called Army of None, Autonomous Weapons in the Future of War. Um, and I guess you, you heard from him a little bit earlier. Uh, today, and also we have uh, Michael Horowitz, who we just heard from, uh, and that will be our, uh, our panel. And uh, at this time, I would like to uh, introduce our, our first speaker uh, when we're going to hear from Mr. Burnham. Thank you, Will. Good afternoon, everyone. It's nice to see you and nice to be here. And uh, Amir, thank you so much for inviting me to come. I'm really grateful for that. The, uh, I'm here to bring maybe a little reality into the discussion of swarms of drones and great robots that are attacking uh, one another or perhaps our troops. In fact, there's some basic things we have to understand. I, I'm the former chief financial officer and chief operating officer of the U.S. Department of State. I remember Colin Powell going around the table and saying, all right, well, we're going to do that, that, and that. And then always the last question was, uh, Burnham, do we have the money? If you don't have the money, you can't do a lot of these things. The, 
instead of talking about drones and, uh, and about robots, how about efficiency and savings in government? And by the way, one of the great opportunities of artificial intelligence is to bring savings and efficiencies to government. And so I sort of feel like, you know, where's our little cell here within our community here uh, this afternoon to really start focusing on how we make it faster, better, cheaper? And even Michael mentioned that, and Paul mentioned that as well. Faster, better, cheaper, right? Faster, better, cheaper on the battlefield, and faster, better, cheaper in the, in, as the tail supports the tooth out there in the forward edge of the battle area. Sam Palmasano, who's a friend of mine, he was chairman of IBM, was tasked by President Obama to take a look at the data centers we have around the United States government. We have 8,600 data centers. Sam and his committee eventually determined that the United States government could get by with three. Now those three, we wouldn't continue to run the United States government. We would, and I'm not sucking up to those in the room, we would give it over to Google. We'd give it over to Amazon. Amazon's already doing it for the CIA. We'd give it over to Verizon or AT&T. And we'd do that, and you know how much money we'd save every year? Wait for it, $88 billion. We have five data centers brand new at the State Department right now. Why do we need five data centers managed by uh, career foreign service officers? No, instead we need it managed by you and we need to save the money, and we need to plow it back in to uh, the programs in our government that are underfunded, as well as the programs like this. As Amir said earlier this morning, you know, if the Chinese are going to spend $150 billion over the next five years, and we're going to spend $1 billion, then we're going to fall behind. How do we do that? Well, I'm going to give you a, a figure. Right now in audit, I know that's not sexy for you as much as it is swarms of drones. But right now an audit at major accounting firms, I'll just uh, mention one in particular without giving the name, they have 35,000 accountants, all smart young people, doing audit for corporations and non-for-profits and colleges uh, around the United States and around the world, 35,000. They sample 5% of your accounts. Within 10 years, that number, 35,000, is gonna go down to 5,000 accountants and they're going to go from auditing 5% of your accounts up to 100% of your accounts. It's data. Data coming in that's going to empower a way that we will that we've never seen before in terms of accountability, transparency, budget and performance integration, all because of artificial intelligence. When I got, I was former state treasurer of Connecticut and got elected in 1994. At that time, Bill Edgars, who was working for the Heritage Foundation at the time, wrote a book called revolution at the roots. Far different from the one that Al Gore read a couple years earlier, Reinventing Government, Bill really came in with a, a vision for how to make government faster, better, cheaper. He's written eight books since. I asked Bill um, just the other day, uh, he now runs the Center for Government Innovation at Deloitte. I asked Bill, how many people could we run the state of Connecticut with uh, which has 55,000 state employees today. If we utilized all the tools that, that you all can come up with and Deloitte can come up with and, and Google can come up with, he said you probably could reduce it by half. Now there's a secret, we don't talk about reducing it by half, we talk about redeploying these people, redeploying the tail to the tooth, right? <laughs> but suffice it to say, say the Connecticut $16 billion budget, uh, 70% of the costs are personnel. If I can save 25, 30, 35% of that budget, it means that the state of Connecticut, which has 110, unfunded, 110 billion unfunded pension liability, will not go bankrupt in the next five years. Just take a look at the costs of personnel, the true costs of personnel at the Department of Defense. So the DOD budget has about $177 billion in there, but in fact, if you do a full analysis, because so many of the things, veterans programs, veterans health programs and whatnot, we spend about $412 billion a year on personnel. What if all of you can come up with the algorithms that give us the opportunity to cut that in half? Could anyone in the room figure out what we should do with an extra $200 billion? 
I just wanted to mention one thing quickly in closing. I know I'm already beyond my time. You know, fake news wasn't invented by Donald Trump or it wasn't invented by the Russians or anybody else. In 1777, a series of letters, seven letters came out, uh, allegedly written by George Washington that said, I hate this revolution. I'm loyal to King George III. I want this war to end. Congress in Philadelphia are a bunch of idiots. For the rest of uh, President Washington's life, General Washington's life, he said, I never wrote those letters. And in fact, ultimately, scholars have determined it was written by a guy by the name of John Marshall in, in Great Britain. He was a Virginian who had moved back, stayed loyal to the, uh, the king, and that they had done that in an effort of fake news. But how do we know with AI, which is so sophisticated in terms of producing pictures today, that the best experts can't determine whether or not it's a real picture or one that was fabricated by artificial, fabricated by artificial intelligence? Or what about voice? Voice is the same way. You can have anybody saying anything right now, and you will never know whether it's real or fake. I'm on the board of a manufacturing company that makes the battle dress uniforms, the BDUs for the uh, Army and for the Navy SEALs. And we are now working with MIT Advanced Fabric Centers to come up with wearables, wearables that do all kinds of things, gather data on, on where your troops are at any given time, the condition of your troops, uh, embedding into, impregnating into the material uh, freeze-dried blood platelets, so if you get wounded, it quickly comes in there and stops the bleeding in your wound. The data, that data needs to be aggregated. That artificial intelligence needs to be applied to the very clothes on the back of our warriors. And then finally, we all know that beyond just robot against robot or in, uh, individual fighting uh, man against individual fighting man, it's also going to come down to uh, cyber warfare. And as our uh, Google uh, deep mind defeats the best Go champion in the world, and as we aggregate that and as we train our cyber warriors, and these algorithms will learn from our cyber warriors, we all know that we are in a very short period of time going to go to machine to machine cyber warfare. Finally, please, please don't think audit isn't sexy. It can be really sexy if we're able to take $200 billion and turn it over to all of you. Thanks. And our, uh, our second presenter is uh, Paul. We okay on the audio? Okay, that was a little much. Um, who wins in this contest? of artificial intelligence. If we're looking at AI as something like an enabling technology, like electricity or the internal combustion engine, that in the past fueled the industrial revolution, what does that mean for how this process of change plays out over the next couple decades? And who rises and falls? And how this influences the balance of power among nations? We're seeing the beginnings of a process of not industrialization, that's the wrong term, cognitization, just like the Industrial Revolution allowed us to create machines that were stronger than humans for special purpose tasks, we're now able to create machines that are smarter than humans for special tasks. We saw in the Industrial Revolution that the balance of power shifted between nations and even the fundamental building blocks of power itself. Coal and steel producing nations became more powerful. Oil became a global strategic resource. In fact, shifting geopolitics and what regions of the world countries fought over for supremacy. So what does that begin to look like in an era of artificial intelligence? Is it data, right? Whether data is the new oil? Is it human capital? Where are the best AI researchers? Where are they being trained at? Where do they go ahead and work at? Is it having the right uh, national incentives to allow startup companies to flourish in places like Austin, right? Or is it having these ideas, as Dr. Horowitz talked about, the ideas for how to use this technology and incorporate it? We could think about multiple ways that AI is changing national security, specific national security uses of AI, drones, autonomous agents in cyberspace, 
as well as underlying changes in the international system itself. So ways that AI might be used to make government more efficient, as Christopher talked about, but also when we think about things like AI changing the nature of work, how does that change international politics, international relations? If we now have large segments of society that may be unemployed or underemployed, how does that change their views on nationalism or free trade or America's role in the world? With the beginnings of this process, it's very difficult to see how many of these things will play out, but we can see glimmers of this already today. Things like AI-enabled forgery changing the nature of truth. What does it mean to live in a world where seeing is no longer believing, hearing is no longer believing? When uh, generative approaches can develop very sophisticated forgeries, and now we have to turn to different approaches to thinking about what is in fact truth itself. These are the kind of challenges that we're dealing with in thinking about how nations will begin to go up with AI. The US has some major structural advantages here, but with other limitations. China has a new national strategy on AI. They have closer integration between some of their civil sector and their military. We don't see that in the United States. Some of the top AI companies are American companies, but they don't work with the national security community. There are some companies that do, um, but there are many that don't. So how do, do, in the national security space, we find ways to be more welcoming to the private sector, to be better customers, and be able to integrate this technology rapidly. Those are some of the things the US government is dealing with now, we're gonna have to continue to deal with, and uh, we'll talk some more on the, on the panel coming up. Thanks so much. So it was last month, right, there, we, uh, there was a, a UN uh, gathering where they I think the, the chairman was quoted as saying something like, don't worry, robots aren't taking over the world. Um, but there wasn't really any consensus on whether or not AI generally and autonomous weapons specifically need to be regulated by governments or by other entities. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering if, uh, is this something that you know, the world needs? And if so, how do you balance any kind of regulations and any kind of things that might stifle uh, innovation versus the need to, to make sure it's not the Wild West out there. Um, and uh, yeah, I guess any, any of you can start. But, uh, I know this is something we were talking about before backstage, so. It's well, I think that, uh, I think that uh, Paul already mentioned it uh, a little bit at lunch, which is that, um, or perhaps you, Michael, that you, know, you, can't, you cannot regulate. We did, re regulating nuclear weapons didn't work too well, did it? Uh, what makes us think that the United Nations, uh, in any way, shape, or form, could ever regulate uh, artificial intelligence? The strength, obviously, of the United States over virtually any other culture is that we have the most innovative and ADD people on the face of the earth. Hey, what are you talking about? <laughs> and Did he insult us? I'm sorry I wasn't listening. I reminded one of us. Yeah. You're never going to shackle us. Yeah. Well, so is it just... So so I, I think the, uh, I think the, I like to call this the, the arms control dilemma, that the, the more important a technology can potentially be for military operations of countries that might actually use their militaries, the harder it is to effectively regulate those kinds of systems. And to the extent that we believe that, that AI is, is, you know, again, something like the combustion engine, an enabler that could be in everything, the incentives to effectively regulate it for lots of countries go, uh, go down. And there, there's also concern about you know, what would happen in a world if the you know, United States tied one hand behind its back while, while China, you know, Russia, and others were sort of pushing full speed ahead. The, these competitive dynamics uh, make, make regulation much more difficult. Yeah, so countries have been discussing autonomous weapons at the United Nations for the past four years now. And um, discussions have been moving pretty slowly while the technology is moving very, very quickly. And when they started the conversations a few years ago, the technology, you know, a lot of the things that are exciting people now about AI and machine learning were just in a very nascent kind of stage. We've seen tremendous advances in the past couple of years. And that's a major problem in this conversation is this, this slow pace of diplomacy um, relative to the rapid pace of technological progress. And so we're seeing those discussions start to shift and incorporate more thinking about AI as a whole and other applications. Um, 
one of the challenges is politics. It's this arms control dilemma. Um, there are a handful of countries that have said they want a ban on autonomous weapons, but none of them are leading military powers. So you know, the US, Russia, China, uh, the people that are actually ahead in autonomy, they've said, well, it's like it's so hasty. Um, I think the historical track record is mixed here. There are lots of examples of failures of attempts to control weapons, but there are many examples of successes. Um, nuclear weapons is kind of a mixed case. We haven't been able to get rid of them, but the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty has successfully slowed proliferation. Um, there have been historical attempts that have been successful at arms control on things like um, biological weapons, chemical weapons, blinding lasers, um, weapons that use the environment as a, as, a t as a tool of warfare. So there are some, some examples here. It's a bit of a mixed bag. Um, you know, whether the diplomacy actually gets there, I think, is a whole other issue. So just, one, just one more very small thing. This is the military example of something that I suspect you're all familiar with, which is that the regulatory environment almost always trails technological innovation. But so is there also, uh, uh, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think that the Pentagon has set limits or, and rules really on, on what exactly autonomous weapons are. And so is there a, uh, maybe a slippery slope there where if you are working on this, uh, on artificial intelligence in general as a, as a field, um, is there a, a point where innovation could be weaponized faster than anything a government could do um, versus basically uh, limiting what, what, what's, what's innovated? So, so the US government actually is one of the few countries that has a very clear policy on what it will do. Um, in, in full disclosure, I was involved in writing the policy when I worked he in, wrote the policy. in the defense department. Right. Well, we three thousand point people. zero nine, right? Yeah. So, and it, it, it sets, I would sort of say, um, boundaries and a guidance process for developers. One of the things we were concerned about when we did it was that people developing some of these next generation systems wouldn't know what they could or could not do. Um, and this had already come up, you know, eight or nine years ago. People saying, "Well, we're adding more autonomy. How far do we want this to go?" Like, full autonomy, what does that even mean? So the policy kind of sets some clear guidelines. It says, look, if you're doing things like things we've already done in the past, like some of the weapon systems that I talked about over lunch, that's fine, go forth and do that. If you're doing anything new, it doesn't say no. It says that there's kind of a, an internal bureaucratic process um, to go through to get approval to do that first, to make sure that you test it and, and uh, make sure that it's not gonna you know, go berserk on the battlefield and kill someone. Um, but it, you know, that gives at least some guidance to the U.S. going forward. And uh, well, basically, but if if things are already moving faster than any possible guidelines could be set, or, you know, wh where does that leave us? Is it a, is it a, a, a moot point to try and and uh, and set limits at all? I, you know, then you also have uh, social groups like like there was a letter that was signed by Elon Musk, right, saying that we sort of have to do this before it gets out of control. And we're already at that point. I think it's interesting that Elon Musk simultaneously is, is really concerned about the effect of artificial intelligence on the world and is leading companies that invest heavily in artificial intelligence. The, the I mean, look, I mean, he's way smarter than me, but the, uh, I think there is a, the, we're, we're gonna, it's tough to stop the engine of technological change. I mean, I don't think that that's realistic. I think what, what we need is in, in some ways conversations between uh, between businesses, between academic researchers, between government to, to figure out how do we manage the consequences of these developments in a way that, that brings out the benefits of AI potentially rather than the cost, whether the area is military or, uh, or, or, or something else, because I, I think the, the, the genie's not going back in the bottle. I don't know. It, it's gonna take uh, the world uh, as it took to create the test ban treaty, nuclear test ban treaty, as it did to uh, create um, uh, uh, National Security Directive 68. If you remember your, your uh, NSC history that uh, defined how we would uh, both use containment and the use of nuclear weapons, you know, first use of nu nuclear weapons. The, the, all these things took uh, years to develop. AI is going to gallop ahead of that. Uh, we're not gonna put any restrictions on it within the greater uh, American uh, enterprise community, hopefully, and uh, as such, as this gets both into our our uh, homes and into our lives, but also into our military and into our defense posture, 
the world will have to catch up as it did with, uh, with uh, the nuclear age from 1945 until um, the NSC Directive 68. So but, like, can I respond to that? Yeah, so, I mean, you know, lucky for us, this is not the first time humanity has tried to deal with some new technology that's come along that seems really scary. Um, nuclear weapons, biological weapons, poison gas. Um, there's a whole, actually a whole slew of technologies, things like submarines and airplanes that came around the turn of the century that, that people were very worried about their effects on warfare. And one of the things that comes out very clearly historically looking at these attempts is that when people tried to look at the state of the technology, sort of a snapshot in time, and then regulate it, they tended to do very poorly. They often wrote restrictions that, that um, prohibited things that turned out to not be problematic, but then didn't prohibit the things that turned out to be really bad. Um, so they, it was hard for them to envision the specific ways the technology would evolve. One approach that has been more successful is people thinking about the underlying principle that they want to guide how they use the technology. Um, one example is there's a, a ban on using lasers in warfare to cause permanent blinding. It doesn't specify the power of the laser or the frequency. What it says is, is that countries um, can't build weapons that are intended to cause permanent blinding. And so it gives some flexibility in how the technology evolves. It focuses on kind of the main principle. There have been sort of a shift in the dialogue internationally on autonomous weapons on this front, where people starting to focus on the human and say, well, what is the role of the human in warfare? Let's, let's, we, got a, we got the autonomy that's important, but the autonomy is shifting all the time. People don't change. What role do we want people to change, play in war? And if we had all the technology in the world that we could imagine, what would we want people to do? And I think that's a, a constructive way to think about the problem and to kind of guide us through um, managing the fact that technology is constantly moving. Paul, Paul, you referenced uh, two pieces of history. The first was the, uh, the Hague Treaty of 1895, which banned aerial warfare uh, using airplanes to bomb people. And of course, the second great one was the, I think, 1922 Kellogg-Briand Pact right. that I like to say went snap, crackle, pop yeah. by 1939. Yeah, that didn't work so well. <laughs> outlawed, Kellogg-Briand Pact outlawed war. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Not a success. But isn't there a, a danger here? I mean, uh, you know, if, if we're talking about, if you look back to like the, the Gulf War, uh, you know, the United States had, uh, and still does, has huge technological ad advances. Of, you know, in, in 1991, we saw things like the smart bomb and, and, and GPS guided missiles. And, um, it, you know, the, the, is there, um, you know, by the same token, if you have more artificial intelligence, you could maybe limit casualties. So I'm, I'm wondering if, is there sort of a push and pull here where the, you know, if you're talking about the, the, the role of a, of a person in warfare, it may not be as dangerous um, and it, 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 may, it may not be as deadly, um, but by the same token, it might be a lot harder to win a war for a country like the United States where we have a technological advances and we can afford to spend a lot more money training technology, things like that, but we may not be successful. Um, do you have, I mean, is there a, where does, where does the, the sort of push and pull stop on that? I think it's really, it's really challenging, and the, there could be upsides and, and downsides. One imagines a world where you know, artificial intelligence systems, you know, in theory, don't get, don't get tired, don't get angry, mm -hmm. are, are less likely that you know, there might be some circumstances then in which they might be more effective than, than people in a variety of tasks, military uh, and non-military. But you know, also, as been, been mentioned before, they also can be brittle and deployed outside the context that they're developed for can cause catastrophic accidents. In some ways, and this goes back to something that I said earlier, the, the responsible use of this technology is gonna require a renewed emphasis on, on training, in a way, and understanding, trying to make sure that, say, commanders and political leaders still feel accountable and responsible for the use of military force, even if much of that force was, is directed by, potentially directed by autonomous systems, so that, that'd be sort of way, way far out. The, but also for, for commanders in understanding what are these capabilities, what is this artificial intelligence system doing, when can I use it, when shouldn't uh, I use it? And that's the piece where thinking about the, the educational backgrounds and, and training of what, what the, the future military and future sort of national security leadership uh, looks like will be, will be really important. 
So I think this begs the question of what are humans good for? Um, I don't know. In, ge <laughs> in general, like if we can define the task narrowly enough, and if there is a clear right answer, I think over the next couple decades, we'll be able to build machines that can do that task better than a human. Mm -hmm. Particularly if there's an objective way to measure better performance. Humans are good at things that require context. Machines don't do very well at that today. Humans are also good at things that require judgment or weighing competing values, particularly if there are different kinds. Um, things that don't have a clear right answer. There are lots of things in our lives that are like that, that involve judgment, um, where I think people, we're gonna want people doing those things for quite a long time. And it's certainly the case in war as well. There are things that involve moral judgments. So there's a doctrine in the laws of war called proportionality that accepts um, that collateral damage happens in war, but it can't be out of proportion to the military necessity of attacking a target. That's all it says. It doesn't give numbers. It doesn't say, well, you know, if you strike a tank and two civilians die, that's okay, but not five. It, that's up to human judgment to do. Could we someday program a machine to do that? Maybe you could put rules into a machine that would follow it, but those are ultimately things that might be very context dependent and that we're relying on humans to make those calls. We don't want humans to actually make those calls. So I think we want to think about what are the things we want humans to do. Um, I think there's value in humans feeling more the responsible for actions on the battlefield. And that a world where no one went to sleep at night and felt responsible for what happened in war would be bad for a variety of reasons. Um, the laws of war don't say you can't do that, mm -hmm. but that may not be the kind of military that we actually would want to build. But those, those rules are going to go beyond kinetic warfare. And as I mentioned briefly, when you deal with the creation of a video or a, a audio, fake news of some kind, America's policy has been that we are not going to uh, manipulate other people's media the way our media is clearly being manipulated. Um, but we have to ask ourselves, should we be doing that? Should we uh, be uh, responding uh, an eye for an eye? Uh, clearly, everyone's going to have the capability, even somebody in uh, a recent article about hackers in Macedonia creating uh, fake news. So the questions then become not just how do we uh, use AI in kinetic, warf in kinetic warfare, how do we use AI in, in public diplomacy or diplomatic warfare or, or in um, uh, uh, the, the warfare of information. And the thing that you mentioned before, which I thought was actually a great point, like bringing the sexy back to audit <laughs> through uh, AI is, I think, a hugely important implication that we don't tend to talk about because it doesn't involve like a weapon per se. Or like protecting against ransomware, perhaps, things, things, right. things of that mm -hmm. nature. Yeah, or the personnel slide that you put up. I mean, those are the kind of things where, as, as Christopher showed, the, the financial savings are tremendous and may be the most significant, potentially, in terms of app national security applications and also the easiest for the government to import because then you could just, you could just buy things right off the commercial market rather than having to go design something unique. And, and Paul, if I could jump on that, uh, we all know that in World War I, it took seven individuals in the rear to support one right. Uh, American fighting man out there in the Ford Edge. The, by Vietnam, it was uh, 12 to 1. Most recently, uh, in Iraq and Afghanistan, it was 20 to 1. How far are we going to extend the tail in support of that tip of the spear? What if we could cut that tail in half? That has to be yeah, one of our huge. great focuses. Well, uh, this already came up in, in the Q&A uh, a little bit earlier, but um, you know, I'm interested in this idea that uh, China and perhaps even Russia might be closing the gap. I, you know, the, I know the Chinese government is spending billions of dollars right now to, to, to try and really develop an AI program, and, and Vladimir Putin talked about how important it is to be the world leader in, in, this, in this area. Um, is, uh, you know, five years doesn't seem like a long time to me. Um, is there anything that could be done to sort of widen that gap? Is it, you know, are, are we already sort of losing ground faster than we can make up? Um, and again, that's sort of, I guess, for, for anyone who wants to speak to it first, but. Uh, I think they're going to disagree with each other, so I want to go last. <laughs> well, well, I'm going to say you can't count those, those dollars. They simply don't have the sophistication we have between uh, Palo Alto and Cambridge and, and uh, uh, the Texas. The, uh, um, and the amount, the amount of money that, that uh, the Googles of the world and the uh, Facebooks of the world are throwing at this uh, dwarf what the Chinese and Russians are throwing at this. That's the reality. But they might not struggle with some of the moral and 
policy questions we're thinking about, right? You mean our adversary right. won't right. struggle? Right, right. With or Google. Right. Which one do you mean? Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, in this case, I was talking about China and <laughs> not Google. Shimmer. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think this gets to the a question about where does advantage come from? Um, and you can think about all these kind of key components that, that are required to make this technology effective. So hardware, we heard um, earlier this morning about Google's TPUs and, and other sort of hardware um, processors that are optimized for this. You know, um, the, the human capital, um, the number of AI researchers being trained, where they're being trained, where they go even after they they study uh, the financial resources that come into this, um, but also the ability of uh, having organizational processes that eff effectively allocate capital, right, which is obviously a place where the U.S. excels, um, and then having a regulatory system, and here the U.S. is in a much better position than, for example, say, Europe, that allows people to try new approaches and kind of go do things and then, and then adapt as a society. I think the U.S. has a lot of major structural advantages um, that have gotten us to where we are today. Uh, that will continue in this space. I think it's worth acknowledging that China also has some major advantages. They have some serious AI companies, places like Baidu and Tencent and Alibaba. Um, I hear from major leaders in AI, like these people are on the top tier, right? You can't count them out. Um, they have a lot of AI researchers. They're not quite as good yet right now as some of the top US ones, but they're catching up. Um, they, they have a lot of data. Right? So they have access across China then to use that, and they may have different privacy laws, and China not allow them to use kind of this data for different purposes. They have closer civil military integration that allows the military to harness this. So I think it's, it's not clear. I think it's likely that we're going to see a place where um, we become much more equal, and there'll be some sp places where we're ahead and other places where China's ahead. But you can think about what a national strategy would look like to compete in this space, and we don't have it. We simply don't. It would involve things like better government investment. We're not gonna be able to eclipse what the private sector's doing, but there may be targeted investments the government should be doing in AI basic research, but also things like building a better regulatory regime, better, better immigration policy. Why are we making it hard for the top researchers in the world and scientists to stay in the United States? That's not an effective national strategy. So, so I do think that the lack of a coherent national approach is a, is a major um, problem for the United States. So, so you touch on two things there. One, you touch, of course, on the visa policy of the United States. We, of course, limit our PhDs and our, our engineers to, right. and bankers and lawyers mm -hmm. to no more than 100,000, 110,000 a year. That is really stupid, as we know. Uh, we should open up. You're educated here. You're getting advanced degrees. You should be able to uh, stay and, and work here. The second thing is, is that rather than uh, having the government invest, and I'm not sure that the government does great investment. I mean, DARPA, one of the most amazing things in the world, doesn't actually do anything internally. They put out $3 billion a year, and they have the rare ability to fail. They have the rare ability to put out $3 billion a year, and if it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out, but yet the spectacular things that they've funded, or for that matter in the intelligence community, Incutel, or the Office of Special Capability at DOD right now, spectacular stuff. What it comes down to, though, is not having is maybe government funding those th opportunities in the private sector, for sure. But it's also about redefining the public-private partnership, which I call procurement. Procurement is broken. Procurement will never work. We cannot continue to go out there and say we're going to have three bids and it's going to take two years. We're going to select somebody. It'll take another year to implement and, and, and fully integrate it into our systems. By that time, that software or that application is three or four years old. And we all know there are a million zero-day events, uh, malware events every day. How can we possibly keep up when we have a procurement system like that? Which means we need to migrate to public-private partnerships. Instead of having one of our labs or something within uh, office within DOD work on that artificial intelligence, why not partner with Spark Cognition? Or some of the other fine firms out there that, by the way, are going to continue to attract the young people to come in here, the smart people are going to continue to find the solutions we need with the kind of flexibility and innovation that can address, address our needs today rather than a procurement system that will purchase something that's already years old. So let me uh, just jump in here to say that I think that there's a, a risk sometimes when we talk about this when we focus just on, on China and that, I mean, we're, we're, we're simple, or at least I'm simple, and we like analogies. And 
So we were tempted, the temptation now has been to compare this to the space race. And you know, just like we competed with the Soviets in the space race, we're competing with China in, in AI. I think given the, the properties of this technology and the way that AI is commercially driven and not just a widget, this is much more like the late 19th century. It's much more like the sort of industrial revolution where you have the steel industry and the chemical industry and, and you know, Germany and the US and the UK and France and Japan are all competing. I think that's gonna be more like what this competitive uh, landscape looks like over time. So I think that while, while China and Russia are, are important, and in particularly China, I actually think that the competitive landscape is gonna be much more multifaceted than it was, say, when, when we were thinking about technological leadership during the Cold War. Well, it, I think it brings an important point, which is when you think about national advantage in this space, it's not just about building the widget, but being able to manage this broader process of societal change and being able to have institutions within society that are able to adapt to changes in transportation, in healthcare, in the future of employment, and able to weather these societal changes in ways that make um, the United States still a, a, a vibrant nation in, in the coming decades. Well, what about this idea that the, sort of the free market can, can, can save us? I mean, I think the free market's gonna do a lot for us. I think the free market is what, what got us, in some ways, to this leadership position in the first place, but and with, with a little guiding hand, I mean, that's why the three billion from DARPA is important because it, it helps set priorities and incentivize uh, you know, private, sector, private sector work. But I, I think that the, the free market's gonna do a lot for us, but what government can offer in this space is the ability to, to sort of put its thumb on the scale to, to assist in some areas where maybe the market isn't delivering enough research because market incentives aren't there yet. Well, because the risk is different. The risk, right. DARPA can afford to, to, to fund something that fails, and no venture capital firm can, can do that to any great degree uh, on an ongoing basis without getting sued right. as a fiduciary. Similarly, it's the comparative advantage in some ways of academia, and one of the reasons why America having the world's leading, you know, not just Silicon Valley, but Stanford, is such, is such an advantage because the, the research incentives are different than the research incentives in, in, the, in the free market. And that you have academics that can afford to fail uh, sometimes and who can do sort of uh, deep, longer term experimental research that can produce sort of basic breakthroughs that companies can then exploit. But I think, I think it's worth differentiating between a free market economy and a free market society. The, markets are, the free market is good for the efficient allocation of capital. Um, you know, that doesn't always necessarily lead to, if you think about societally as a whole, right, um, a, a, a solution that actually benefits everyone. So if the efficient allocation of capital means that millions of people are put out of work or underemployed, is that a win as a society, right? right? That might be the best way to maximize profits, but does that lead to a stable and healthy country? Um, probably not. So how do we think about weathering those kinds of changes? We're going to open it up to questions here in just a, a few minutes, so be uh, thinking about if you've got any questions, and they can uh, bring a microphone um, around to you. Um, but just, just sort of as a, as a last question um, here, uh, is, I'm having a really hard time, um, and I'm kind of sort of new to this, this whole topic, but it, it seems to me that we get to weaponization very, very quickly. And I guess maybe that's true with anything, right? Like, if, you're, if it's a big, important policy, eventually people are going to find out a way to make a weapon out of it and try to kill each other with it. Um, but you know, um, is there a way to um, to harness all of the all of the good work that's being done here without also immediately making it into an, into another arms race, into another space race, into another nuclear weapons race? Um, I think the, I think that the, I would say the militarization of artificial intelligence will happen a lot faster than the weaponization of artificial intelligence. And by that I mean the, that's the, that's the audit in some ways. That's the, the sort of back office in the way that artificial intelligence can, sh can shape the way that, the way that sort of militaries, the way that militaries recruit and train, the way that logistics functions. The, I think that the, there's some degree of weaponization will happen, but one of the things I think we forget is, is just how automated a lot of weapon systems are, are today, uh, actually. And you know, I, I, don't think a, I don't think an anthropomorphic robot's gonna replace a soldier on the ground anytime soon, and may, may, maybe even ever. 
But there's a, there's a, I think, surprising degree of automation. Uh, it was surprising when you first sort of engage on it in, in a lot of today's weapon systems. And what we're probably talking about in the short term doesn't really look very different than, than many of the weapons that we've, we've had for decades. Yeah, I mean, there have been um, some researchers, some AI and robotics researchers have written kind of letters saying, well, you know, don't, don't weaponize AI or don't use it for military ends. That's like asking countries not to use electricity for military purposes or the internal combustion engine. It's just not practical. And, and, and yes, these things are already exist in military systems today. I think there may be specific narrow uses that do raise particular issues about um, controllability or safety right. or stability where militaries themselves may actually want to not use those things. Nobody wants to control their weapons more than militaries. Right, like because they may lead to fratricide or other accidents, or they may want to cooperate with other nations and say, like, look, you know, let's agree that if we kill each other, it's at least intentional, right? And and let's and there are it's, it's hard to do to reach that kind of mutual restraint, um, but there are some examples of successes. Chris, I, I have no faith that we'll ever be able to contain the weaponization of either AI or genetics, for that matter. Yeah, that's a whole other. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I wanted to end on a really down note. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.